city-state of Chiang Rai, Thailand, 1434. Lightning arcs down, crashing into the monastery stupa. Stone explodes, brick dust fills the air. And when the abbot goes to inspect the damage, he finds a luminous green statue. The famed Emerald Buddha. Supposedly made in India 1,500 years before, it had been taken to Sri Lanka to save it from civil war, then to Angkor Wat, then it was captured by a Thai army who hid it in this stupa, I guess. Rare and beautiful, possession of it granted an almost mythical legitimacy to any ruler. So, naturally, the abbot's king wanted it sent to his capital in Chiang Mai. But the elephant carrying it stubbornly went to another city instead. And figuring that it was a divine message, it resided there for 32 years before the next king did in fact move it to Chiang Mai. But then an earthquake toppled the stupa it was housed in. So in 1552, a visiting prince decided to take the Buddha back with him to Laos. But then the capital of Laos was raided by the Burmese, and the prince evacuated the Buddha to yet another city. There it stayed for 200 years, until a Thai general looted it and took it to Bangkok, where it does, in fact, remain today. At least until, you know, someone captures it again. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us well fed on a busy schedule. Now, you might be asking, why start the episode with that overly complicated story of the Emerald Buddha? Well, legendary origins in India aside, its journey actually provides a pretty good snapshot of how Buddhism spread through Southeast Asia. Originating in northern India, Buddhism spread to Sri Lanka during Ashoka's reign, then out into Cambodia, Thailand, and Burma, present-day Myanmar. And once there, Buddhism would not only be present as beliefs and practices, but as a form of royal legitimacy that underpinned the political order. It's a story that starts in Sri Lanka, a kingdom that, according to Sri Lankan Buddhist tradition, was supposedly converted when Ashoka sent his son and daughter to the island to make it a new capital of faith. Buddhism in Sri Lanka would take on its own character, evolving into a localized belief system that came to believe that it, rather than India, was the center of the Buddhist world. Also, it was a very specific kind of Buddhism that they practiced, Theravada. Early in the Buddhist movement, generally dated around the time of the Second Buddhist Council, Buddhism began to experience schism. If you'll remember, Buddha gave his teachings orally, and they were supposedly only written down decades after his death, though some scholars claim this was actually more like a few centuries. This meant that once the Buddhist scriptures were written down in the Pali language of the region, enough time had passed that there were differing interpretations on what was known as the Pali Canon. Adding to that, varying schools developed their own commentaries on these scriptures, leading to more divergent beliefs. Some of Ashoka's rock edicts even feature laws against schism, showing that he tried to prevent the religion from further splintering, especially for his favorite tradition, the Theravada, meaning School of the Elders. Now today, Theravada is the only one of these early traditions still practiced, and it adheres to the type of Buddhism we've discussed in past episodes. As you can probably guess from the name, it's conservative, stressing adherence to the Pali Canon, reverence for what they see as the historical Siddhartha Gautama, and asserts that one attains nirvana through practice as a Buddhist monk. Meanwhile, other traditions that we'll discuss in episode 5, like Mahayana, have a few other options. Though Theravada lost its tradition of nuns for reasons that are still unclear, some stories claim that in the 10th through 12th centuries, northern India, Sri Lanka, and Burma were hit by several waves of foreign invasions, including the Mongols, which wiped out so many nuns that few existed to train the next generation. But it's probably not quite that simple. It more likely had to do with how Buddhism changed in order to adapt to Southeast Asian audiences, which is something it is uniquely good at. Buddhism is a shapeshifter. As a religion that came from the same melting pot as Hinduism, which would be a vegetarian melting pot just to be clear, Buddhism shared many of its beliefs like reincarnation and karma. That meant Buddhism was good at living side by side with Hinduism to the point that where they coexisted, the two tended to borrow elements from each other. And if an area had previously converted to Hinduism, it made it fertile ground for Buddhist conversion. Hinduism had already made it out to mainland Southeast Asia, as well as the Indonesian islands, via the trade routes. Ships from Sri Lanka carried Indian cotton to Indonesia in exchange for spice, and kingdoms in Thailand sold ritual objects like bronze drums to middlemen traders who took them to India. Frequently, the merchant families that sailed these routes actually settled a wing of their family there, usually a younger brother and his wife, to work as an agent. That way, the resident agent could buy goods when they were cheapest and hold them until the family ship arrived to take them on. And these merchant settlers developed small communities and built Buddhist temples. 
Meanwhile, monks still traveled to spread the message of enlightenment, adapting it to the local culture and region. And we can especially see this adaptation in bodhisattvas, figures believed to be future Buddhas, spiritually powerful individuals who will eventually become enlightened. Bodhisattvas function in Buddhism in a vaguely similar way like saints do in Catholicism. So Buddhism adopted local gods or heroes as bodhisattvas, incorporating elements of Vishnu, Shiva, or legendary kings into them in order to help appeal to local tastes. This melding resulted in a type of Theravada Buddhism in mainland Southeast Asia that largely stuck to its roots when it came to monastic life and core beliefs, but took on a distinct flavor when it came to art, folk tales, and performance. Though things were a bit different in the Indonesian islands. There, Hinduism had rooted itself deep, and Buddha never gained a total conversion. So instead, he joined the Hindu pantheon to form a syncretic religion known as Hindu Buddhism. And if you're interested in that, we actually went into this a bit in our series on Majapahit, which you can watch here. Though, to be clear, it was not all coexistence. At Angkor Wat, which we also have a series on, man, we do a lot of shows, Buddhism left a mark, quite literally, with a chisel. Originally a Hindu temple complex, later Buddhist rulers would deface the Shiva imagery and install Buddhist statues in its place. And those Buddhist kings felt they were absolutely right to do so because Buddhism also brought a new style of monarchy to Southeast Asia, the concept of a righteous king. Stories of Ashoka's deeds were never forgotten in Buddhism, and he became a model for both judging future monarchs and understanding how power should be wielded to create a Buddhist society. The kings of Thailand, Burma, and Cambodia were not quite god kings, but they did cloak themselves in an air of Buddhist righteousness that made them semi-religious figures worthy of veneration. These kings, many of whom spent at least some time in a monastery living as monks before their coronation, ruled from palaces filled with temples and shrines, having monks as part of their court. Some in the Middle Ages invited monks from as far away as the Himalayas to instruct them in secret rituals meant to increase their power, with a few kings even believed to have supernatural abilities. And these beliefs still exist today. In fact, when Rob last visited Cambodia, a tour guide told him that the body of the current king is iron hard and cannot be cut with blades, that he's cool even in the extreme heat, and he was allowed by the Chinese authorities to sit on the throne of the Forbidden City, which, just to be clear, definitely did not happen. This idea of a Buddhist state ramped up even higher in the colonial period, when countries like Thailand, Myanmar, and Cambodia turned to the religion as a unifying force that helped define what it meant to be Thai, Cambodian, or Burmese. And Buddhist nationalism proved a major component in resisting and throwing off foreign rule, from monks holding nonviolent protests to assisting in the self-conception of newly independent nations. However, this has also had an ugly knock-on effect that continues into the present day. Some governments like Sri Lanka and Myanmar that consider Buddhism an intrinsic part of their national character have often clashed with religious minorities. Sri Lanka denied Tamil Hindu citizenship, helping lead to a civil war that ended only in 2009, while in Myanmar, the government has killed 25,000 Muslims and driven over a million into refugee camps in neighboring countries. We can only hope that the Buddha's message of nonviolence and Ashoka's demonstration of religious pluralism influences minds there. But Theravada was not the only or even the most popular school of Buddhism. As Theravada moved south, another tradition was sweeping through China, where it would help tame the Mongols, create Kung Fu, and help Japan find Zen, Mahayana Buddhism. But religious traditions aren't the only things that can be modified over time to better suit a societal need. There's also things like popular music, social norms, and what we all have for dinner. That last one being of particular interest to me these days, thanks to Factor. So with summer winding down and conference season spinning up, my personal time is actually more at a premium than really any other time of the year, which leaves me very little of it to do things like eat, which I know I need to do. And sure, I could always order takeout a bunch, but my bank account lives in constant fear of that crushing financial weight. And and frozen meals have too many preservatives in them and just taste a little like I'm dying inside. Well, this is exactly where Factor comes in to resurrect my stomach. They're a phenomenal ready-to-eat meal delivery service that takes the guesswork out of my breakfast, lunch, and dinner with every meal ready in two minutes with no prep, no mess, and no cleanup. It's just really good food ready whenever I have time to eat it. 
And Factor also has a big old rotating menu of 35 delicious chef prepared dietitian approved meal options that you can choose from each week to really achieve any nutritional goals you may have. Everything from keto, veggie, protein plus, vegan options. They got calorie smart, which are meals around 550 calories or less and just a bunch more. And actually a really cool thing is you can even mix and match between all of those to ensure that everyone in your household gets the exact type of food that they love fast. For instance, a few days ago, I was feeling just drained and needed something hearty for dinner, right? So Q Factor's Creamy Tomato Pork Tenderloin to my rescue. Seriously, I couldn't believe how good it was for the effort to taste ratio. And the best part was, then I got to use the time I saved to do something fun that I wanted to do, which in this case was to build more battle maps for my Curse of Strahd campaign, because I smell a TPK coming. So if you want to eat better while also being better with your time, all you gotta do is head to factor75.com or click the link below and then use code extra credits 50 to get 50% off your first factor box. Yeah, that's like a bunch of free food. <laughs> then not only will you be getting fast, tasty meals that fit your lifestyle, but you'll also be helping to support our shows and the people who make them. Oh, and do not sleep on their smoothies, by the way. They are a perfect midday pick-me-up, and at this point, I can't live without them. Again, that's 50% off your first box at factor75.com and use the code extra credits 50. I'm not sure why I went full Princess Vespa from Spaceballs there, but that's where we are. <laughs> What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 